Hi, if you want to know how to become a professor in biology, stay with me. Hi and welcome to the Uncon School at howtobecomeaprofessor.com, the web show to learn from unconventional professors and experts. My name is Stefan and I'm your host. Today you're going to learn how to become a professor in biology. For today's episode, I've, I've invited Mohamed Noor. He's a professor and chair of biology at Duke University. His specialties include evolution, genetics and genomics. With BS from the College of William and Mary and a PhD from University of Chicago, together with a postdoctoral residency at Cornell University, he specializes in Drosophila evolution and in 2007 contributed to the publication on sequencing the genomes of 12 Drosophila species. The corresponding paper published in Nature that year has become the benchmark for the emerging field of comparative genomics. More recently, his research team has focused on understanding variation and recombination rate within and between species and its impact on DNA sequence variation. In 2008, he was awarded the Darwin Wallace Medal from the Linnean Society of London. He was editor for the International Journal Evolution, is or was associate editor for several other journals and the author of over 100 publications. He has served as president of the American Genetic Association and as an officer or board member for the Society for the Study of Evolution and Genetic Society of America. Professor Noor has been active in education and outreach, receiving numerous teaching and mentoring awards from his institution and more recently teaching an online course in genetics and evolution. He and his group also developed laboratory activities for implementation in high schools and colleges, including a commercial kit for observing natural selection in Drosophila. <clears throat> Professor Noor, thank you so much for taking your time for this interview today. The first question I'd like to ask you is, how would you plan your career in the field of biology today? And if it's possible, please be as specific as you can. Well, thank you so much for uh, talking with me. That was a very gracious introduction as well. I appreciate that. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. So how would you plan a career in biology? Uh, going all the way back to high school, I guess, the, the key is, is uh, from high school and into college, the first thing you have to do is find out whether you love the subject. This is going to be true not just for biology, but for any science and probably any field in general. That in order to be successful in, a, in an, any sort of academic field, you need to not only just be enthusiastic about it, but you need to love it. You need to absolutely love what it is you're doing and what it is you're studying and, ha and just crave more information. You, you have to have a very intense curiosity about what it is that you're going to go into. Um, obviously, a lot of these other things, again, are going to apply for just about any field. You'd certainly have to work extremely hard and being uh, extremely enthusiastic will force you to actually work very hard in these areas. So, for example, in college, you need to do well. If you're in college, you need to have good research experience. In order to go on for a PhD in biology, you have to have shown that you are very adept at research. And not just that you get A's in your classes, that that's also important, but that you actually have some sort of research experience. Uh, you have a really strong recommendation letter from a research supervisor. And ideally, it would be even nice if you have even published some of your research, either yourself or as part of a collaborative group. You need to be an effective communicator. You need to be able to go in and, and enunciate exactly what it is you've done. You need to really lay out your projects, the significance of your project, not just the mechanics, not the day-to-day, -day, I took a pipetter and I pipetted this much of this into this, but it really needs to be very explicit on the impact of the work. I am trying to study a gene which affects risk of breast cancer. In the past, it's been shown this gene has this effect. I am trying to identify X. So something very specific and effective on why people should actually care about what it is you're researching. Um, you need to be you need to be very organized, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you need to you know set up your time very well. You need to be efficient at what you're doing. Time time is you know it's an asset, but it's also sometimes an enemy, right? That you have a body of work that needs to be completed. You need to be as efficient about it as possible and maximize what you're doing. And finally, you need to be willing to take some risks. Mm -hmm. that you know your research projects are not always going to pan out the way you expect so you need to try some that you know maybe have one outcome that would be really exciting one outcome that isn't as exciting try it and see what happens and you know if it ends up with the less exciting outcome or if there's maybe an unexpected outcome be ready to you know go in a new direction just try something that maybe is not exactly what you anticipated when the whole process started 
Oh, all right, okay. Thank you very Thank you very much for the very comprehensive but still concise answer. Next, I'd, <laughs> um, next I'd like to ask you, you know, there, there is such a vast number of journals and conferences out there on biology and biology in itself is, you know, um, breaking down into various subfields and so forth. Could you recommend, you know, the most relevant journals and conferences and if it's possible, breaking down to the career stages? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. The, the answer is actually fairly complicated for that. Mm -hmm. Now, historically, people have always identified the journals of science, nature, and cell as the leading journals. Those are the areas where one would expect some of the most cutting edge research to be published, things like that. It's certainly a good place to start. Um, it's going to depend on the resources that one has. So, for example, let's say somebody's in high school, you may not have access to the most recent issues of those because they are not what's referred to as open access. Mm -hmm. Those are journals that require subscriptions and they may be fairly expensive to get a hold of at times. Things have definitely been changing over time now. There's been a push by a lot of people, and this is a bottom-up push, not a top-down, a, a push to actually have more research more freely available. And you know, of course, with the growth of the internet over the over the last 20 years, this is this has been a possibility. We've had a, a burst of new open access journals. These are the ones that anybody anywhere can access at any time. So, for example, the Public Library of Science, which is often abbreviated PLOS, has a family of journals. PLOS Biology being the highest tier of those. That again is a place where you'll tend to see a lot of cutting edge research, and anybody has access to it at any time. But more fundamentally, there's a subset of scientists out there, and this is not, I don't think this is yet a majority, but it's, it's, it's a definitely an increasing subset of scientists out there who argue that we should put all our work in outlets like this, even if they're not necessarily ahead of time perceived to be the highest tier outlet. So one journal that has grown quite a bit is this journal called PLOS One. This is also from that public library of science. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, all work that goes there is reviewed uh, just in the context of whether it is scientifically valid and not necessarily based on impact. But the idea is that you should put, in theory, all work into a journal like that and then let history decide what was high impact or what was not. Because sometimes it's hard to anticipate ahead of time this particular finding may be revolutionary, but maybe not. It depends on how it ends up being applied. As a novice, I definitely would not, if you're talking about something in high school or in college, I would not say just go dig through PLOS One and try to find out what's going on in a field because I think there will be there will be an incredible diversity of topics and you'll never be able to narrow it down. So as somebody, so you asked me to break this down to career stage, as somebody who's just starting, I would recommend still at this point looking at the, the, the traditionally perceived to be top tier journals such as Science, Nature, um, and maybe PLOS Biology as well. Mm -hmm. Just to get an overview of things that were highlighted by some subgroup of people as exciting and hot. And you know, the tricky thing again with Science and Nature is, is you require um, a subscription or some sort of uh, institutional access to get to it. Right. As you go on through your career, as you go into graduate school and you start to specialize into particular things, there are particular journals that will be identified as the leading journals in those areas. For example, if you were to go into the field of genetics, the journal Genetics is an extremely reputable journal. It's been around for you know 100 years or so, maybe not quite that long, but for quite a long time. That is where a lot of the cutting edge work in genetics is, is published. If you go into developmental biology, you might look, uh, look at the journal development. So it's going to specialize by subfield as you go further in your career stage and you as an investigator start to specialize. Now, I suspect by people who are now in college, by the time they actually, if they were starting in college now and then eventually going on for a faculty position in biology, I think the landscape is going to be changing quite a bit. And I think this push for open access is really going to change the dynamic of, of what journals to look at. And you asked also about conferences. As somebody just starting out, there there aren't very many really broad conferences that, that are particularly useful. It's, it's, one nice thing is, let's say for example, if you're a starting graduate student, it's nice for your first conference maybe to be a regional conference. Conference. We have one in our area called the Southeast uh, Evolution and Population Genetics. It has a horrible acronym. It sounds like seepage. But that, that's one that a lot of people tend to go to is maybe their first conference as they're just starting graduate school, maybe when they don't have a lot of data and things like that. But eventually you want to go to the top conferences in your field that, that of course, that you can get to. So, for example, I, as an evolutionary biologist, tend to go to the conference that's associated with the Society for the Study of Evolution. There's also a European version of that same conference that's also extremely exciting to go to. And that's where you really tend to see some of the cutting edge work in my area. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we've already reached the final and last question. Sure. Um, yeah. 
I was wondering how have you been able to maintain a consistent high level of discipline and motivation throughout your entire impressive careers? I mean, naturally there have been also, you know, um, hurdles. times, hurdles and barriers to overcome. You know, do you have any strategies how to overcome that? That's a, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right that uh, when you're working in any field of any sort of science or academic field at all, you're going to hit rough times. You're going to hit times when, you know, a series of experiments all don't work. You're going to hit times when you've been working on something for a year and it turns out, well, uh, what I thought I was seeing was completely wrong. I need to throw that out and start over. And, and yes, it's, it's, you know, it's personally very frustrating to say the least. My personal strategy with it is, 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 well, I have a couple of strategies. One of them is to have multiple simultaneous projects going on. The hope is that all of them will not be failing at the same time. <laughs> That's one. Two, I have to say, just personally, I take a lot of enjoyment from my interactions with people in my lab that, you know, I really have a good time doing research with them. And, you know, yes, when we hit hard times, but we meet it together as a team. It's not just my hurdle or, or you know, my student Katie's hurdle or something else. We all, it's a hurdle for all of us. And, you know, we, we work together as a team and, and almost in some ways like a family. And the third, too, was once you actually have a faculty position, you have a little bit more flexibility, especially post tenure, you have a little bit more flexibility in how you construct your time. So if research is being extremely frustrating on a particular day, I'll say, you know what? Today, I'm just going to focus on making my class for tomorrow and I'm going to make it a really good class because I know I can actually do that. Or if class is frustrating, then I say, well, tomorrow I'm going to focus on my <laughs> research a little bit more heavily. And it's, the nice thing about being a faculty member is we can actually do that. And we do have certain pieces that absolutely have to get done at other times, but we can be the time to just maintain some sanity. Okay, that's awesome advice. All right, if you guys want to learn more about Professor Noor's work, then check out his online course, Introduction to Genetics and Evolution. You'll find a specific link to that course in the show notes. And if you like this interview, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to visit us at howtobecomeprofessor.com. Professor Noor, thank you so much for being so generous and sharing your um, expertise and uh, giving us so fatherly advice to us. Thank you so much. No problem. I enjoyed it. Thank you.